an online meeting and it isn't Zoom, they refuse to attend on the grounds that they say, I'm too old to learn 27 interfaces. <laughs> um, good to see right, Blair, by the way. Big, big shout out to Blair. Fantastic. Well, Roy, I'm so glad you're here. I think most of the people know you, uh, and I don't. We've already wasted so much of your time, so I'll turn it right over to you. Hopefully, you'll talk about champagne and high-speed uh, rail and a little bit of Red Bull. But we'll turn it over to you. Ideally, we'll, you'll throw out some ideas, and we'll have a little chat, and we'll go for about forty, you know, thirty, forty-five minutes. Well, okay, I'll talk very quickly. Um, and what you'd like is probably ten minutes of chat, followed by because um, you're all. Um, as or more interesting than I am by the look of things. So I'll talk for about 10 to 15 minutes and then hand over to the audience. Perfect. But it all goes back, fun enough, since you mentioned high-speed rail and Chateau Petrus and supermodels. A lot of my thinking and a lot of the thinking in the book goes back to that moment. And it's not actually, it's not so much the moment or the joke or the point that I want to reiterate. Although... It's still interesting. Okay, for those of you who don't know, I became kind of accidentally micro famous in about 2009 because of a kind of half joke I told, which is simply saying that rather than spending six billion on high speed railway lines between London and um, Folkestone, which would have reduced the London to Paris high speed rail journey from something like three hours, 10 minutes to two hours, 40 wouldn't it have made more sense just to put Wi-Fi on the trains, which wouldn't have cost six billion. It would have cost maybe 30 million or so to do something remarkable. Because in terms of what actually makes a train journey more attractive than an air journey, to be honest, the air journey wins on speed, pure and simple. If all you care about is speed, you probably aren't going to be traveling by train anyway. On the other hand, the, the time on the train is useful. And it's also an uninterrupted three hours, which most business people crave, okay? Whereas the time spent traveling by plane is bitty. It involves a huge amount of... The problem with air travel is, ever since they introduced security, air travel basically became dominated by arsing around. You know, you turn up, you check in some luggage, you go and check in, then you go through security, then you go to a lounge, then you go to a gate, then you're made to wait at the gate, then you board the plane, then someone else crushes your laptop in the overhead lockers. It's not a high-quality experience, particularly for short flights. So I made that little joke, which I simply said, why don't you put Wi-Fi on the trains? And then I added a whimsical suggestion, which is actually... If you wanted to spend just one billion pounds rather than 50 million, uh, you could employ all of the world's top male and female supermodels for 10 years. You could pay them all to walk up and down the train, handing out free glasses of Chateau Petrus to all the passengers. You'd have saved yourself five billion pounds and people would ask for the trains to be slowed down. Now, everybody thought it was kind of funny. OK, everybody thought it was kind of true. But it's impossible to act on that suggestion. And what I want to know is why. Now, fast forward 15 years, OK, and they're now proposing to spend something like £80 billion on a high-speed railway line between London and Manchester. And I said, well, look, it's going to take you 25 years. It's going to cost you £80 billion. What's the point of this? And they said, reduce journey time and increase capacity. And I said, but I can do that. By, I can do that, and I can do that in a year, and it'll cost you about £4 million. Okay? I can reduce journey time and increase capacity. And they said, no, you're talking nonsense. I said, let me explain. Let's just recontextualize the problem. Okay, Let's define journey time not as the time you spend on the train, but as the end-to-end -end duration of your journey. Okay, Now, here are two very simple things you can do. Nobody's done them, okay? Every time I travel to Manchester, I book something called an advanced first-class ticket because if you book a fully flexible ticket, it costs about a million pounds, so you don't. So you book an advanced ticket, which requires you to travel on a specified train, okay? If you miss that train, your entire ticket is void and you have to pay full fare for a replacement ticket, okay? Now... As a result, you leave a huge margin of error in order to catch your train, which means I tend to arrive at Euston Station to go to Manchester 45 minutes before my designated train departs because I can't take the risk of missing it, which means I hang around uselessly at Burger King, basically waiting to board the train I'm booked onto, during which time two trains leave, 
20 and 40 minutes before my own train, because there are three trains an hour, and they're half empty. Okay, So I simply said you could uh, very easily uh, simply have an app. OK, and it says I'm at Euston already. And the app, provided there were train capacity, would say, well, pay us 10 quid. And instead of waiting till the train at 940, you can board the train at 920 or at nine o'clock. That would reduce journey time by 20 or 40 minutes. Not the engineer's definition of journey time, which starts when the train leaves, but the consumer's own experience of journey time. Furthermore, it would massively increase train capacity of the network and minimize the risk of overcrowding. Let me explain why that is, by the way. If you want to get the maximum capacity of people through a rail network, okay, you should always allow people to travel on earlier trains if there's capacity. Because that way, you then free up later capacity and minimize the risk of basically having unavailable seating. Now, this is intuitively obvious to human beings in one setting. If you watch the footage of the evacuation of the U.S. Embassy compound in Saigon, what you'll notice is they filled up every helicopter with the people there who are waiting. I don't know if you noticed that, OK? They didn't, because if you were trying to escape Saigon, OK, it would have been incredibly off pissing to have someone to say, I'm terribly sorry, this helicopter is going to leave half empty because you guys are booked on the 1230 departure. Right. If there was a seat available on the helicopter, they put someone in it because that's how you increase the maximal carrying capacity of a network. And it's no different for trains than it is for helicopters. OK, so my point was for one million pounds to produce the app, two or three million pounds to advertise the existence of the app. OK, I could, in the space of a year, increase capacity on this rail route and I could reduce journey time by 20 to 40 minutes on average. Right. Now, I don't know what you think of three million pounds, four million pounds. It's a lot less than 60 billion. I think we know enough maths to realize that. Now, here's the thing which I think is going on. OK. First of all, there are very easy ways to solve problems. One, you start by thinking as a systems thinker. And secondly, you recontextualize. The thing that absolutely fascinates me is I wrote about this. I went to politicians about my suggestion. No one was interested. I wasn't even saying don't build the high-speed railway line. I was saying it's pretty dumb spending 60 billion to increase capacity and reduce journey time and wait 25 years to have that delivered when you could achieve much of the same effect at three orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude less money, okay? And you could do it more or less in the space of a year. Now, do you all agree that, that that's a perfectly sensible point to make? So my question is, what is it about institutional decision-making that makes people incapable of this kind of creative solution? And my hunch is that systems thinking is basically low status, whereas deterministic thinking is high status. Engineering conversations are high status, um, whereas marketing conversations or conversations about human experience or anything that involves recontextualizing outside very, very narrow scientific and economic metrics is basically not admitted in the Overton window of policy making or business decision making. Okay. And the interesting question there is that I noticed this because occasionally as a marketing person, I got made a non-executive director on various boards. And I suddenly realized that being a marketer on a board is completely useless, particularly if you're the only marketer on the board. Because someone will come in and say, we've got product X and it's actually underperforming by 27.3%. OK, and so what we're going to do is we're going to cut, cut the price by 15 percent, because according to mainstream economic theory, if you if the price goes down, demand will go up by no means actually a reliable predictive um, belief. Uh, in many cases, you can put the price up and demand goes up. Uh, that's Brian Large why Peloton became popular, by the way. They just ramped up the price. OK, but nevertheless. To say we're cutting the price by 27%. In other words, you don't look at the problem as a whole systems problem. You concentrate on the narrow, measurable, and deterministic small component of the problem, which is accessible to Newtonian physics. Okay. And you solve for that on the
assumption that you maximize the efficiency of a system by maximizing the individual parts, optimizing the individual parts. Everybody knows that's not true. Okay, You don't optimize a system, a complex system, by optimizing the separate parts individually. But for some reason, that has become the, the, the only acceptable mode of institutional decision making. So this would happen. I'd be the non-executive on the board and they'd go, we're going to drop the price by 7.9% because demand's actually underperforming by so-and-so, so-and-so. Now, when you think about it, dropping the price of something should be the very last thing you try. It should be a pure mark of desperation. It should not be the first thing you try. OK, because you're effectively bribing people to buy your product. It's an admission of complete failure. And I'd be sitting there in the back of the room. And what I really wanted to say was, have you thought about making it pink? But I knew that I couldn't say this because if I did say something like that, everybody else on the board would regard me as a total idiot and never listen to anything I said for the next three years. So the weird thing is that Status seems to me, and seriousness seems to me, and e economists are guilty of this, it seems to me inextricably tied up. And you could argue that educational attainment both selects for and rewards this skill. Your ability to take a small sliver of a problem which happens to be mathematically tractable and to find a single optimization route for that narrow conception. Whereas the much more valuable skill of looking at the thing as a system and recontextualizing the problem with a whole system view is regarded as being the province of not serious people, cranks, weirdo arty types, and nutters. I'll give you a lovely example of this, okay, of systems thinking. So let's look at solar panels. It's fair to say, now remember this, I think it's worth remembering this quote actually, uh, which is by that brilliant uh, physicist, um, God, the guy who was involved in the Challenger trial, I've briefly forgotten his name. So if you can you remember his name, Nobel Prize winning physicist. Richard Everybody, Feynman. Richard Feynman, right? Richard Feynman rather brilliantly said, outside his own specialist field of expertise, a scientist is usually just as dumb as the next guy. Okay? <laughs> so let's look at solar panels on roofs. Okay? Now, um, some of the finest brains in the world, and I think it's fair to credit them with this, have been involved in making solar panels both less expensive and more efficient, to a point of view, to a point where actually it's probably economically sensible to install solar panels. Not only if you live in Arizona, it might make pretty good sense if you live in the UK or Canada. Okay, it's a remarkable technological achievement. How do you install solar panels in your home? Well, the answer seems to be you write a check for about $40,000. Some people come along and irremovably and irreversibly attach them to your roof. Okay. Now, let's just look back from the point of view of a marketer. Any marketer knows if there's one decision that the evolved human brain really hates making is one which, however logical it may be on average economic terms. Okay. If you look at the average, yes, solar panels will pay off. Something with a 5% chance of irreversible disaster, which costs $30,000, is the last decision that consumers ever make. It's a decision like moving your bank, okay? It's a decision like, you know, um, renewing the boiler in your house. If there's one kind of decision that humans, the, the amygdala, really, really hates making, it's a massive, irreversible, one-off commitment, okay? You know, marriage, that sort of thing, right? Now, asking people to spend 30000 uh installing solar panels on their house is akin to trying to get married to someone on a first date, okay? It's not going to happen. And yet these incredibly intelligent people have optimized, who've optimized the panels haven't recontextualized the problem to a point where they say the best solar panels are not the ones that are most efficient or the ones that are cheapest to manufacture. The best solar panels are solar panels that actual human beings might actually fucking buy right? Now, two things you might do is you might make the process modular or you might make it reversible. Now, I went on YouTube and they're total lunatics on YouTube, and I mean borderline insane, who are making solar trailers for their Tesla. And they basically buy a load of solar panels, rig them together, attach them to some sort of thingy. It's not a capacitor. What's it called? It's an inverter, I think. Okay. Now, if you don't drive your Tesla for three days and you leave it plugged into this little solar trailer, which is on wheels, okay, it fully charges your car. 
Now, the interesting thing is I've never wanted to install solar panels on my roof, but the second I saw a solar trailer, I wanted to buy it immediately. I thought, get me one of those fucking things. They're brilliant, right? And it occurred to me that the, the reason is obvious. One, it's modular. That's a sensible kind of punt. I can make three a $3,000 punt, cock up, and I won't be plagued with regret. But the second thing is, if I don't like it, I can sell it to somebody else, right? It's not an irreversible decision, whereas bolting the bastard things to your roof, okay, is basically totally irreversible. And so the strange thing is, is you can have spectacular intelligence in a very, very narrow field because we select for intelligence and we reward intelligence and we promote intelligence as far as it can solve problems by narrowing down the variables to three and four and pretending a three-body problem is a two-body problem. In other words, by reducing a problem through oversimplification for a, where a point where it's mathematically tractable and delivers a single right answer solution. Now, the single in a complex system, by the way, there isn't a single right answer. Here you go, a bit of Niels Bohr for you. Niels Bohr had two brilliant quotes, which I wish I'd included in my book, but I only discovered them afterwards. One of them is in my book, but I didn't realize it was Niels Bohr. I thought I was being original. Okay, And the two quotes are, you are not thinking you are merely being logical. That's one of Niels Bohr's criticisms. And the other one is the opposite of a great idea is probably another great idea. There's a fundamental assumption which our education system instills in us, which is that the trick to being intelligent is to distill down information to a point where it delivers a single right answer that is provably right, okay? Whereas real world intelligence actually is the instinctive brain's ability to fuse a whole load of different ideas together to come up with something original and new, but not necessarily defensible. And so I think defensive decision making is having a huge deleterious effect on business creativity and innovation because not only does it demand that everything we do makes rational sense, it has to make rational sense in advance. OK, but if you look at Dyson, Nespresso, Red Bull, Amazon Prime, um, I could reel off a few more, Gusto, Blue Apron, none of those businesses made any sense in advance. OK, no one before Starbucks existed was wandering around going, why can't I spend four dollars on a cup of coffee? OK, Red Bull, who would have thought that the most successful attempt to compete with Coca-Cola was a drink that comes in a tiny can, costs a fortune and tastes disgusting. Right. No one was asking for that. OK, and yet it is the most successful attempt to compete with Coke. James Dyson, if he'd come to me and said, I think there's a market for an eight hundred dollar vacuum cleaner, I would have had the man sex sectioned. OK, and then if he'd said, but wait, you haven't heard about my four hundred dollar hairdryer, I would have had him escorted out of the building as a dangerous lunatic. Yet he's a billionaire and I'm not. Now, what I'm saying here is that we're somehow making the deployment of naive rationality as a precondition condition of any activity seems to me to be an extraordinary limitation on progress for the simple reason i get to end here okay i think there are just 10 times more great ideas that you can post rationalize than there are great ideas you can pre-rationalize i think if you make pre-rationalization the condition of anything you try experimentally, you're limiting yourself to about 10% of the potential solution space. And there are also ideas, by the way, which are only obvious when you've had them. Now, I'll give you a perfect idea because I'm fairly confident in saying you're all an incredibly bright group of people, okay? But when I say to you, next time you move house or remodel your kitchen, you should get two dishwashers, okay? All but one of you, I'm willing to get, will go, this guy's on crack, right? Why the hell would I have two dishwashers, okay? Okay, now, the interesting thing is, it's only obvious in retrospect. When you have dish two dishwashers, you don't lose any storage space, and you never have to unload a dishwasher. Let me explain, okay? You have an empty dishwasher, right? You fill it up with dirty shit. You turn the dishwasher on, at which point it's your clean dishwasher, and then you retrieve things from the clean dishwasher, eat off them, put them in the empty dishwasher, which becomes the dirty dishwasher. Eventually, when the dirty dishwasher is full, you attach a post-it note to it saying clean, you turn it on, and then the whole process reverses. OK, but I'm willing to bet that that is only obvious to you now I've explained it and that it never occurred to any of you, hugely intelligent though you may be, in advance.
I, I have think two dishwashers. Now you're the guy. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> Total. This this guy is a don. Okay, you see, it's really interesting. Now, everybody with two dishwashers knows this, and basically thinks everybody with one dishwasher is insane. But it's impossible for people with one dishwasher to understand the logic. It has to be seen to be believed. And so, I think there are so many ideas out there which we'll never get to through sequential logic that actually our requirement that everything we try has to kind of make sense and our denial of experimental thinking is a massive obstacle to progress. So there you go. That's why I wrote the book. Love it. So who has a question? I'm happy to go first, but I'm sure somebody's got one. So just jump in and ask away. Blair, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I want to say, hi, Rory. I uh, really appreciate this. I, I missed your opening remarks. I was having some technical problems here. Um, I've got I to ask, Blair, where are you? Because someone told me you live in some incredibly obscure part of Canada. Is that true? Yeah, you know where Vancouver is? Yeah, no, no, that's not obscure. <laughs> I'm a short 11-hour drive from Vancouver. Fabulous. <laughs> oh, joy. Um, I've read your book. I've heard you talk. Um, and still, when you're going over these principles again, it's just, I'm just, the insights are profound. I, um, when you're talking about systems thinking, I think about the marketing procurement problem, which is, you know, you and I kind of operate in that world. Um, and the marketing procurement problem, I, I go back to systems thinking. It, there's a basic tenet of systems thinking that says, and you've essentially elucidated this, which is that um, when you optimize you optimize the, a, a subsystem, you suboptimize the system. And I think that most of the problem that you just talked about is effectively yeah. that, right? It is beautiful. I've never heard that before, but that is beautifully put. Thank you. So I think of marketing and procurement. The problem with marketing and procurement is procurement is driving, is in the pursuit of efficiencies. Marketing is in the space of innovation. And these two things are mutually opposable goals. And they don't understand that you cannot efficiently procure innovation. Right. So procurement is not optimized towards a better marketing solution. They're optimized towards saving money. So procurement is optimized towards saving. Marketing is optimized towards innovation. And you've got it. And and the problem resides at the CEO level. And I think this is why you're running into problems with institutions, with governmental institutions, because they this it's the CEO's job, and you you hit on this point too in different language, it's the CEO's job to balance, look at the different subsystems and decide where they're going to be suboptimal. And when the CEO doesn't step in and say, hey, marketing and procurement, you two are at odds with each other, we need to compromise, then one is allowed to dominate. And it used to be that marketing dominated, now procurement dominates, right? And I, I wonder if the, the challenge that you articulate because you do so much work with government isn't doesn't stem from the fact that politicians, they're not really optimizing for the system. No, they have, they have kind of an alter ulterior motive. There's something that's really important to them that they're optimizing for. And hence well, the trade-offs there, there, there are a few things there, which is you'll never get fired for optimizing your part of the system, right. regardless of the deleterious effects it has on the system as a whole. That brings me into a few other quotations, which are quite useful, I think, from people in history who've spotted the same problem. One of them is Harry S. Truman, who said, anything is possible just so long as you don't care who gets the credit. Because um, if you suboptimize your part of the system to benefit the system as a whole, someone else ends up getting the credit and the bonus. Okay. Right. And then the other one is, you never get fired. This is the asymmetry between creativity and logic, which is, one, creative people have to, if you have a counterintuitive idea, you have to present it to rational people for approval. That process never happens the other way around. You never get a bunch of accountants in the room who say, we think it's 7.5%, but before we present this to the board, we're going to show it to some really wacky people to see if they've got alternative ideas. Okay. So... A WPP. I was mean, okay. Don't quote me on this because I'll lose my job. Okay, but it's a it's a creative transformation company which runs on 1950s Taylorist lines. Okay, and we've just had this thing where we're told you've got to use Microsoft Teams rather than Zoom. And I said it's a pandemic. The whole world's shifting to remote working. 
The first assumption you've made is that we can only have one video conferencing platform. Given the cost savings in travel, it would make sense for us to have about three, okay? I would happily write a check for WebEx, Zoom, and Teams. Secondly, by the way, which is more likely to be the good video conferencing system, the one you pay for, Zoom, or the one Microsoft gives away for free to stop you migrating to another platform? I think we can guess the answer to that question, right? Okay? <laughs> okay. You know, if it, it's the jack-of-all-trades heuristic. If you only make money out of video conferencing, you know, Gordon's gin. If all you make is gin, you've got to make pretty good gin. There's a bar around the corner from me called Bloody Mary's. When I go there, I always order a Bloody Mary because if you call your bar Bloody Mary's, you've got to be, make a pretty good Bloody Mary. You can't skimp on the celery salt, right? <laughs> okay. It's a simple bit of logic. But the, the optimization thing, and of course, the power of finance, which is the worst case of optimizing for part of the system. Um, uh, and so there's another great quote from Keynes, which is, worldly wisdom teaches it is often better for the reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally, which I think is a very interesting quote. And there's also a fantastic thing. J.P. O'Shaughnessy said to me, he said, the trouble we face is we're a, we're a deterministic being living in a probabilistic universe. And there's a very interesting, um, there's a very interesting story in Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, where he goes to present to the board of a huge company. I think it was GE, but he never says what it was. It's about 10, 15 years ago. And he goes around the heads of all the various divisions, you know, the, the huge metal things division and the lighting division and the finance division. And he goes, I can offer you odds where next year, if you take this decision, there's a 50% chance that your revenue and profits will go up by 50%. There's a 30% chance your revenue and profits will go down by 30%, and there's a 20% chance nothing will happen. Would you take those odds? All but two of the nine people around the table said no. And he said, why not? He said, because there's a 30% chance I'd lose my job. Then the CEO at the end of the table says, but hold on, I'd want all of you to take those odds, because net-net, we're going to end up miles ahead. So the individual risk profile and the individual optimality just in terms of your own individual silo, in terms of your approach to risk, is completely misaligned with what the approach to risk might be if it were viewed collectively. So I think it's, I think it's, quite, an interesting, it's quite an interesting observation. If you want to get political about this, by the way, there's a fantastic book by an anarchist writer called James C. Scott called Seeing Like a State. And it's weird because he's an anarchist, but it's very popular with sort of conservatives in the Cato Institute because he makes the point that the states need to quantify and aggregate things in order to make decisions, causes them to eventually adopt a very, very narrow conception of what's really happening. Because the only information they can process is the information that happens to be numerical and aggregatable. And so what doesn't fit, what, what, what you can't measure effectively doesn't count. So I, I, think that, I think there's some really, really interesting questions here. And I think your point about if you optimize part of the system, you're sub-optimizing the system as a whole is spot on. And yet most companies are run on the assumption that they're one and the same thing. Kind of makes the case that CEOs should be polymaths or at least should be kind of economists in the sense that they're they're always thinking in trade-offs because the heads of departments are not thinking yeah. in trade-offs. They're optimizing towards something. Here's an interesting framing thing as well, which is if I talked about redundancy, okay, or resilience, most people would perceive it as a cost, wouldn't they? We need to have two advertising agencies. We need to have two suppliers of PPE equipment in case one of them goes wrong. And the general men mental framing of that is, okay, it's a cost I have to endure because this thing is systems critical. Okay. But actually, if you have two suppliers or if you have two ad agencies, you're also increasing opportunity because the chance you get lucky is doubled as well. So we need a word like resilience, which captures the fact that there are decisions you can make which look suboptimal in a narrow frame, but which reduce risk and increase opportunity. So, I mean, an example, by, by the way, being of that, which is Coke had a completely separate ad agency, sorry, Pepsi, employed a totally separate ad agency in Texas. 
And the reason was that, I don't know if you've been, most of you have been to Texas, right? In Texas and New Mexico, the number two drink to Coke is not Pepsi. Pepsi, basically, if you drink Pepsi in Texas, you're some sort of sexual deviant, right? You're a weirdo, okay? Because the number two drink is, as we all know, Dr. Pepper, the finest carbonated beverage ever produced by the brain of man, okay? And so the situation for Pepsi was so hopeless in Texas that they appointed their own Texan agency who came up with the Pepsi challenge. Because they said, look, the only way we can do this. Now, in the end, it proved so successful in Texas, getting their market share up into double digits or something, that they rolled it out worldwide. But if they hadn't had a separate ad agency in Texas, they never would have discovered that. But, but, but to the procurement mindset, having a Texas ad agency is just an inefficiency, nothing better. It's, I, I think this is utterly fascinating. And you're right that procurement have a particularly narrow view of what they're trying to optimize. But the weird thing is, if you talk like a systems thinker, most people become uncomfortable because their educational and professional stature depends on their ability as non-systems thinkers. I think. Does anybody else want to pipe in? Roy, I'm wondering how can we introduce, like, yeah, obviously the idea of small bets or, you know, what Blair talks about. Mm. Is this a top down? Is it bottom up? I mean, how can you add in, you know, what do we, like, the idea of what we don't know, right? Or are we making the right decision or placing small bets? Is it, where does that happen from? Um, one thing I think that makes it problematic is that if you define a problem in advance in what you might call seemingly logical metrics, okay, you prevent recontextualization solving the problem. And recontextualization could be changing the scale of consideration, changing it from being a physics problem to a psychological problem. You know, I mean, a classic example is the waiting bar in software, okay? There are two solutions to that problem. Okay, you either make the process faster, which is generally a good thing to do with software regardless, okay? But at the point where you can't make it anymore, if you have something wiggling and going round and round, people are basically pretty happy. And if you if the screen freezes, people go batshit insane. Okay, so if you recontextualize the problem and say this is partly a software problem, it's partly a psychological problem, you end up with something that's actually pretty optimal altogether. You know, I actually, but I'll tell you a very funny story, by the way. If you write a book, if you ever write a book, before you send it to your publisher, okay, go and find a friend with really, really crap broadband and upload it there. Because I, I spent a year and a bit writing that book, and it's about, I can't remember, it's 120,000 words, okay? And you press send, and it goes, pip, and it's gone, Okay. Fucking hell, that's a year's work. I want to watch that upload for at least five minutes, you know? You know, if you've written a book and it's taken you a year to write and it uploads in 0.7 seconds, that's not actually good. That's deeply depressing. <laughs> and so so the, the fascinating thing is, that, you know, you could also reframe the problem so you make the waiting enjoyable. Now, in certain circumstances, I think that's true, by the way. That actually, a lot of, uh, there are travel agencies which do go through this big rigmarole of saying, searching this site, searching that site, searching this site, looking here, comparing prices on kayak, comparing prices here. Now, actually, it sells more holidays because you could do that same thing in 0.1 seconds, but the consumer would instinctively think, well, you didn't look very hard, did you? Right? Whereas if you go through that whole rigmarole of, of pretending to search different sites, the consumer thinks, geez, this is pretty exhaustive. I better have a look at what they come up with. So, you know, there are, there are even occasions where, the op as I said, the opposite of a good idea is another good idea. Um, and so I, I find this just really, really interesting because I think our need to be objective and our need to quantify – I'll give, you, I'll give you a lovely example of a systems problem, right? Okay. Which is quite a lot of things are rational if an individual does them, but totally irrational if everybody does them. And some things are rational if you do them once, but totally irrational if you do them 10 times in a row. If people game the system, for example. You get um, uh, what's it called? Metcalfe's law, isn't it? Any metric that becomes a target loses its value as a metric. But 
there was this thing which happened in Britain, which is companies got too many graduate applicants, okay? And so, you know, people like McKinsey and people like Goldman Sachs, okay, would say, okay, we'll only interview you if you've got an upper second class degree, which is about 60% of uh, the UK graduate output, okay, gets a 2-1 or a 1st. By the way, there's no empirical evidence to show that your degree class correlates at all with your value as an employee above a certain level of competence. The correlation is irrelevant. And then what happened is that was fine to be honest. If McKinsey do it, if Goldman's do it, you know, if you're the kind of piss head who got a lower second, you probably don't want to work for Goldman's anyway. OK, but um, but then everybody did it. OK, everybody did it. And I used to get people coming to me and said, I've got a lower second class degree in maths from Cambridge and I can't get a job interview. <laughs> OK, look, I said, I've worked at Ogilvy for 30 years. And I'll tell you two things. One, I've never come across a mathematical problem so abstruse that it would require a 2-1 in Cambridge maths, not a 2-2. Secondly, if you've got a 2-2 in maths from Cambridge, two things, you're quite good at maths and you probably spent quite a lot of time being sociable, which means that you'll know quite a lot of people who got a first class degree in maths from Cambridge and you can ring them up and ask them to help you out. <laughs> Right. This seriously, your tutu is not an obstacle to employment in my book, and yet they weren't even getting interviews. Okay, and so you get these absurdities where everybody copies it, and I've come to the conclusion, okay, that looking at cognitive bias, consumer bias doesn't really matter that much because it tends to cancel out. Okay, there are some people. You're North Americans, aren't you? You basically choose cars on the number of cup holders. Is that fair? <laughs> 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 I'm winding you up, okay. <laughs> but but you do. People have different heuristics for choosing a car. Some people like looks. Some people like fuel economy. Some people like performance. Some people like cup holders, etc. But if you fuse all those preferences into one car, you do end up with an approximation of a fairly decent car. Okay. The problem with institutional decision making is everybody copies everybody else's biases under the name of best practice. And so the biases don't cancel out. They actually compound. And I just find I, I, coming, I've come to the conclusion that behavioral science often involves a lot of people in institutions going, aren't the public stupid? And actually, behavioral science should be a lot of members of the public going, aren't institutions stupid? You know, um, because institutional decision making is seriously pretty dumb. <laughs> Who wants to uh, ask a final question? I don't, can I ask a question, Mark? Carlo, yes, please. Thank Please you. Do. Hello, Good to Rory. See you. Thank you very much for that. Hi, I've, also, I've also read your book. I'm not um, 11 hours from. Uh, I'm not 11 hours from Vancouver. I'm probably about 30 minutes from you, I think. But um, I'm in uh, Deal at the moment. Actually, are you in Kent? Are you in Deal? I'm in Oxted on the Kent Surrey oh, border. Oh, lovely place, by the way. Toast, um, very good uh, cafe. Yes. If anybody's visiting Carlo, too many uh, bankers place. and solicitors. But other, otherwise, yeah, lovely. same problem um, in Seven Oaks. Yeah. <laughs> I have um, <clears throat> a love deal, by the way. Wonderful golf course at Royal Sankport. Um, I have two dishwashers as well. That's the upside of marrying an Indian woman. <laughs> I, I, by the way, I was with you. It was the most insane idea in history. It's now the best marital decision yeah. I ever made. Because mm. the bit that a lot of people miss is that the second dishwasher is the cupboard that it's taking yeah. the space off. Exactly. So it's it, it's it don't, you're not losing storage space at all. You no. See. Um, no, and I and I loved your book. I, my question is, um, it really picks up on that Niels Bohr idea of, um, you know, the opposite of a good idea might well be a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder whether you, I mean, I, it's a bit of a loaded question. I suspect I know the answer, but I wonder whether really the problem is one of expertise. You know, we're all celebrating experts. And uh, I mean, I love the sort of the Zen idea <laughs> that Shinru Suzuki talks about, that in the beginner's mind, the possibilities are endless in the expert's mind they are few and that idea that we seem to not have the confidence uh, I mean I run my own little business but having been in an institutional environment in the past there's this kind of belief that we can't be confident and maintain doubt at the same time yeah you know the Scott Fitzgerald idea that uh the the, the, the hallmark of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to have two conflicting ideas at the same time and oh. still function and do you think, along with, you know, you, you talked with, with Blair very eloquently about systems thinking and, and some of the, uh, you know, the textures in that that cause problems. Is the problem not often just that fucking idea that we're all cleverer than we really are and we try and overthink everything? We should just dial it all back 
go upstream and be beginners again? Uh, yeah, I think there's a really interesting hypothesis about human rationality, which is the argumentative hypothesis, which comes from two French anthropologists called Hugo Sperbier and Dan Mercer, I think they're called. And um, uh, their theory is that the humans, humans evolved a faculty of reason not to make decisions. Reason plays very little part in, in individual decision making. You just, I mean, there was a great friend of mine, Alex Batchelor, who was marketing director at Royal Mail for many years. And he asked once a conference of accountants, 400 accountants, how many of you actually performed a cost benefit analysis before you bought your last car? And he said, so out of the four or five hundred people, he said, six hands went up attached to the saddest individuals on the surface of the planet, you know. Um, and um, in individual decision making, we don't do this. And the theory is that we develop the faculty of reasoning with the mindset of a lawyer to defend our decisions and to argue for them, right. not to make them. And so we regard as a good decision instinctively, not a decision that will have good consequences, but one which is easy to defend. And so I think that's at the heart of it. And so that, as a result also, admissions of ambiguity and ignorance aren't exactly career enhancing. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, going into a room and saying, to be absolutely honest, I haven't got a clue what's going on here. <laughs> you know, I, I still don't fully understand what's going on with the Dyson, to be honest. Mm. You know, I've got a theory. And my theory is very simple, that basically you get an endorphin rush from a bargain and you get an endorphin rush from an extravagance, but you don't get an endorphin rush from mid-market retail. You know what I mean? You get a thrill from going to Prada, guilty thrill. You get a bit of a thrill from going to TJ Maxx or TK Maxx if you're a Brit. Okay. But you don't really get a thrill from Marks and Spencer's clothing. You do from the food because it's expensive as buggery, right? But the clothing's kind of meh. It's neither one thing nor the other. And so, you know, maybe that's it. You know, you go, well, I've got to buy a vacuum cleaner anyway. So I can either spend £300 and go, ooh, I've got a vacuum cleaner, a bit like the old one. Or you can spend 700 and you actually get a bit of a buzz out of it. You know, I was once shopping for bedding with my wife. And I said in the shop, I said, tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Can we spend one of two amounts of money here? nothing or a lot <laughs> and my wife said my wife said that doesn't make any sense and i said yeah it does because if we spend nothing i've saved 200 quid we've still got the bedding we've got already which i hadn't noticed any problems with and i can go and buy a drone or something right <laughs> on the other hand if we spend a lot i can get really excited about tog values thread counts oxford pillowcases mattress <laughs> toppers you know you know ooh, egyptian cotton right and i can turn it into a bit of a nerdy project but I said, I, what I don't want is a halfway house where I spend 200 quid and the bedding's basically like what we had before, but a bit newer. You know, so there may be loads of areas of human consumption that follow that really weird rule. You know, you know you're either Hope Motel 6 or you're kind of a five star hotel. You know, people in some ways, you know, we get we get we get Motel 6, we get a five Ryanair or your kind of, you know, net jets, you know. <laughs> Rory, thank you so much. Sorry for the uh, technical issues. Do you want to talk a little bit about Nudge Stock, your event in yes. November? So it's on the 11th of June. It's going to be 13 hours. So I don't expect you to watch the whole thing, but we stream it live through YouTube. So if you've got a smart TV, by the way, actually, just as a total distraction, everybody's talking about, obviously, the huge effect that the adoption of video conferencing is going to have on working patterns and property values and everything else. Do you want a good property tip, by the way? This is from my brother, who's an astrophysicist, okay? And it's a brilliant recontextualization. If you divide the UK landmass, this doesn't really, I don't know how this works in Canada, by the way, it probably works even better. If you divide the UK landmass by its population, everybody gets about three quarters of an acre, okay? That's actually quite a lot of land. In Canada, everybody gets something the size of Gloucestershire, roughly speaking, don't you? Okay, right? Blair, you probably can you actually see the end of your garden? No, you can't, can you? No. Anyway, <laughs> but but okay. If you divide the UK coastline by its population, everybody gets three quarters of an inch. So if you're looking to invest in property and you want scarcity value, go for lakefront or seafront property. Okay, as Harpo Marx or whatever said, they're not making that anymore. You know. Anyway, um, 
Sorry, well, I got totally distracted by myself. I'm terribly <laughs> sorry. But that's a great example of a recontextualization. No, what I was saying is everybody's talking about what are the effects on land values and urbanization and density living um, occasioned by video conferencing. There's another big thing, which is actually, which nobody's talking about so much, which is there's a thousand fold increase in the number of events, lectures, conferences, talks, which are being now effectively televised. So we do have a kind of long tail of television. Um, I mean, I went to a conference on insect epidemiology hosted by Duke University a month ago. And I do remember as I logged in thinking, imagine going to Ogilvy Finance and saying, can you give me $4,000 to attend a conference on insect epidemiology and seeing how they react. So actually, this serendipity, which people claim to miss from the office, um, is actually being recreated online. But anyway, nudge stock, it's on the 11th of June. We've got Daniel Kahneman, we've got John Cleese, we've got Dan Ariely, uh, there's a bit of me. Um, we've got some fantastic behavioral scientists. And it's sort of 12 hour online festival streamed live over YouTube. And if you go to nudgestock.co.uk, don't miss out the G because nude stock is a very different website altogether. Um, <laughs> but if you go to nudgestock.co.uk um, and you register your email address, you'll get sign in details and it's free. So there you go. Rory, thank Kahneman, you so much. Kahneman and Cleese. Not bad, is it? Not a bad combination. Rory, that was great. I actually, yeah, I attended Nudgestock last year, which was great virtually. So I'm looking forward to the event in, uh, in June. I said November because I misread it as an American. No, no, it's the, oh, ah, good, oh, I never thought of that. Okay, 11.06. 11 11.06, yeah. so I said November yeah, 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 6th, yeah. but it's, I misread it. Ah, Anyways. Right, okay, I'll remember that. If you uh, haven't I, read, I, uh, go ahead, Rory. I don't know, go ahead. I, I, no, think I was just going right. to say, if you, if you haven't read Rory's book, it's fantastic. He's very prolific. Um, he's great on the Twitter. He's great on the wiki column. So, Rory, this is a real thrill. Thanks for making the time. Thanks, everybody else, for reaching out and joining it's us. And, uh, Anytime. And really good to see you, Blair, because I've been a long-time fan. So really fantastic. Likewise, Rory. Thank you. <clears throat> what a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Talk to you soon. Ciao. Thanks, good to Mark. see everybody. Good to see you, Carla. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Yeah, that was great. Thanks for joining. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to just show up the first time and kind of dominate. Um, You're yeah. good, man. It's all good. Good. Great. Let's talk soon. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Ciao. Cheers. Bye.